Good morning, everybody. I am Stephanie Mackey, District Principal of Indigenous Education. And on behalf of the Indigenous Education team, we'd like to thank you for joining us today for the Indigenous Focus Pro D Day, connecting to Mother Earth through story and traditional knowledge. Today, we have the opportunity to connect with teachings of the land and ties with place, story, and each other. And we respectfully acknowledge that we live and learn on the unceded core traditional territory of the Kwikwitlam First Nation, which lies within the shared territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Musqueam, Kekwa, and Skohomish Nations. And we are fortunate to come together in many different ways today, digitally, in small groups and school teams, to continue to grow our own understandings of place and our connections to Mother Earth. I am honored to introduce Nancy Jo from the Kwikwitlam First Nation. Nancy lives with her family on her traditional lands of the Kwikwitlam First Nation and is also a graduate of Centennial School. Nancy's passion for the land as teacher came from her time as part of several archaeological excavation sites in Kwikwitlam territory and also assisting with returning of the salmon project on the Kwikwitlam River. Nancy is the cultural advisor to the Kwikwitlam First Nation and she is currently learning her language and we are so honored that Nancy is working with us in School District 43, spending time with youth to share her knowledge and teachings for all youth. I'm pleased and honored to welcome Nancy Jo to our Pro D Day today. Good morning, Nancy. Hi, Natal. Um, um, I'm Nancy, I'm Nancy, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Anta Nancy Jo. Talitsan at Kwikwetlam, Aina Shkwalawen Kwanetsi Kwetsnala, Haitsepka Nasiam Nasiaya. So I am um, a student uh, currently uh, with SFU uh, learning the Hunkaminam language. It was something that uh, started with just 10 lessons that uh, was offered to our staff um, that we were just going to begin on uh, Tuesdays um, and uh, we would just do it during the lunch hour. Uh, from there, I was able to continue into a course that started um, that January of last year. And so now I'm in my second year and hoping to bring as much uh, language as we can to, to the community and surrounding communities as well. Um, I'm slowly um, kind of venturing out and helping some of the local schools uh, just with some uh, possible language that we can include for the students and uh, as well as um, historical teachings and, and uh, traditional teachings of Kwikwetlam. Um, but yes, very happy to be here today. Um, so Kukwitlam means red fish up the river. Um, it is something that I have run across um, with my students and my classmates, or sorry, my teachers in my, my courses. And they say that um, the way the word is broken down is actually uh, something different. So I'd have to check into that. But in our hearts, um, in Kukwitlam's hearts, we know it as red fish up the river because that is a really key um, a food staple that we really look forward to and really based uh, who we were um, around that uh, small sockeye run. Uh, so um, the Hunkaminam language is the dialect that is spoken in the lower Fraser River reaches. Um, the other dialects that we have are on Vancouver Island and we're more closely related to the dialect there, um, which is Hunkaminam. And um, they actually chose a different way of using their alphabet, um, which is different from how we use it in Hunkaminam, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet. So that is why there are a lot of different um, characters. Sorry. And um, upriver, we also have Hulkamalam. And so that one uh, we do have connections with and we have family ties there as well. Um, but it is almost considered its own language now, um, just with so much different vari uh, variations in the language, but we also have um, micro dialects that I've recently heard in um, uh, different uh, First Nations from different elders saying that we had so many different micro dialects that are now lost. And so that's the, the focus right now is to reclaim as much language as we can. Uh, so our current population for Kwikwetlam, uh, we're a very small nation compared to the, the local ones that we have, such as Katsi, Musqueam and Silwatooth. But um, we have 120 people. Um, we once numbered in hundreds of thousands in the in the territory. Um, family members recall um, stories um, from their elders saying that almost at every creek, at uh, every creek, sorry, there would be a large family, uh, so large that they would have heads of families come down and meet uh, to discuss 
uh, things to take care of the community, uh, protection and um, gathering of food and resources. Uh, so um, it's just unfortunate that um, it was a bad winter also that hit Quiquitlam, uh, which we're also finding out uh, more information from from Kwantlen First Nation actually. And so this was before the smallpox epidemic, which also um, devastated our, our population. But uh, with the winter that was hit, um, we did suffer quite uh, quite widely across the community. And so we had to ask for help. And so what was awesome is that we did hear that we were able to repay our debt to Kwantlen. Um, but as that's the connection that we have with each other's uh, with other nations is that we we help each other. And Musqueam has also said that we were almost once one. Um, all of us uh, would fight for each other. We would gather for each other. And so there was a lot of uh, interconnection between the communities. Um, so on reserve right now, we only have 60 people living on IR1. We once had homes on IR number two, but they have since moved so that we can more focus on um, the development of IR2, uh, which we're slowly uh, making progress on that. Uh, so 60 people, I actually had to revise the numbers here uh, just to reflect some people who have moved in and um, 54 of those are members. So these are also spouses who live with them who are, who are non First Nation, but uh, they're all considered community and we work closely with all of the families to make sure they feel included. Um, so this is a, a map of our territory. Um, this is um, something that uh, we didn't know in the 90s, as, as early as the as late as the 90s, that it was um, we didn't know what our territory were, was. And so we had to go to surrounding First Nations and um, ask like what what more information because I know uh, Slaywatooth really helped us find out what our name was because we were actually only known by ourselves as Coquitlam Indian Band. So to have that connection with Slaywatooth, um, having uh, Chief Leonard George at the time come to us and let us know what his interpretation was, which was Quaquitlam. And that is also another name of a school in, in the district. Uh, but Quaquitlam was their interpretation of our name. And I'm not too sure if they have their own meaning or if it was just their way that they pronounced it. Um, but then since then, we were able to go to our own elders and elders even up the valley who recall our name being Quaquitlam. And then getting that proper accent in there with the with the Kunkameenum languages, it's really hard with our elders, um, but I, I'm slowly working with them to get them the confidence to to speak it. Uh, so our, our territory uh, mainly encompasses Coquitlam, Port Coquitlam, Port Moody and New West. And since then, we've done interviews with our elders to find out, you know, obviously we went further than that. Um, the direction we got from our elders in the uh, late 90s was that just anything in the Coquitlam watershed, anything that drained into the lake and the river uh, system would have been our home territory. And I find that um, uh, we've heard from local archaeologists that they say that we're very gracious with our boundaries and that a lot of First Nations, they claim a large land base and there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, they have the, the information to say that they were there. So that's what we're going on. We're only going on what we know and the elders that we have left and the information they have. So we do know that um, even my own grandmother, who was also named Nancy Joe, would uh, fish up in the pit lake. Um, she would also hunt uh, mountain goat and, and so many other things. Um, but also from other elders, um, we got interviews with them and saying that we went to Burns Bog for cranberries and other resources, other uh, food sources that we were getting from that area. Uh, so all of that to say that we're, we're using an area of interest map now. And so that is not to say that we're claiming anything and we're still respecting the boundaries of other First Nations, but realizing that we were also in these areas as well and probably a lot further than this. So the lo locations, um, uh, IR number one is located at the mouth of the Coquitlam River, um, kind of at the confluence of the Fraser. Um, this was chosen because we were um, closer to our fishing resource and we were actually given the option, I believe, if I, I recall correctly, we were given the option to have the dikes protect the reserve, but we chose not to because we knew if that dike was there, it would um, impede our, our access and we would have less access and possibly more issues uh, getting access to the riverfront so we could do our traditional fishing. Uh, so we opted out of having that protection, which caused a lot of um, devastation to our homes. And we actually had a lot of stilt homes, uh, even up to quite recently, uh, as, as late as the 70s, 80s. But um, IR number two is also uh, just a little further up on the river. Um, it's in the Port Coquitlam area. It's um, uh, sorry, I didn't go back to, uh, sorry, if I can go back to IR number one, that's the Cayence, and that means uh, young sockeye. Um, again, uh, tying to that uh, food staple that we really uh, cherished and that it was one of our first, uh, first food uh, to come into the river systems after the long winter. And actually it was a very early run. It would come in April. And uh, because of that, when fisheries and everyone were looking at um, how the dam was going to be created, the Coquitlam Dam, um, 
they realized that uh, it was a, not a commercial um, interest to keep it because the commercial fishermen would be going out in August, September. So having the return in April wasn't something that they felt was um, important. And so our, our people did protest it. And unfortunately, um, we're still at the point where we're trying to return it right now, but uh, it does refer to uh, the young sockeye. Uh, Setlamikman is when the tide is high, we go. So even um, back in like 100 years ago or a few hundred years ago, the river was fairly shallow during low tide. And so that is why the canoes weren't uh, travelable up the river. Um, but uh, and then we also have another local place name called uh, Simiko Ella, which is a new name for Riverview. And it's a place of the Blake Group, Great Blue Heron. And it's uh, something that our elders and our community really t uh, treasure those stories from our elders to say that there was many um, uh, herons that would roost on, on Riverview lands. We recently seen them move to the mouth of the Colton River and actually I, I recall many years of fishing there and uh, just seeing them there and now they've had to relocate because of the down or the construction of the new Portman Bridge. And so because of the noise and the the uh, uh, construction activities, it made it really hard for them to roost there. So now I'm not too sure where they moved. Uh, someone said that they might know where they are, but um, to know that uh, they did once roost at uh, um, Riverview, which is now called Sumiqua Ella. Um, our connection to the land um, has been and since time immemorial. Uh, during the time of the Transformers, uh, Hals sent the leader of the Coquitlam people, Quiltamaya, to live and rule over the waters of the Coquitlam River. So that is uh, the creation stories that we have, that uh, Hals is our creator. Um, he had brothers and sisters, but also himself would go to different communities and different systems and teach them the ways of the land and how to look after their communities in a, in a good way. Uh, one of the ones that I'd probably touch base on further in my presentation is uh, something about transformer stones. And so a lot of the times when we had those teachings, um, people would be turned into stone as a, a forever, like an eternal reminder of the teaching and the lesson that we were made to learn. So whether it be about resource gathering or getting along with our own community, um, that's kind of uh, what was uh, done for our creation stories. Um, our connection to our, our water and land and uh, the resources that are around is, is immense. Uh, we do have so many, um, um, opportunities to get food at different times of the year, but winter was still very hard. It was it was very hard, and so the the um, goal and the focus throughout the year was to make sure that uh, we were okay. But um, the salmon, uh, definitely all the five varieties of the salmon, the pink, chinook, coho, chum. Chum was definitely used for smoking, and as well as uh, chinook. And sockeye was more, um, uh, I think, um, kind of consumed throughout the season. Um, for the ocean, we also definitely had connection to get clams, mussels, and seaweed. I have uh, stories from my own family of uh, recently, as recently as the 1980s, of um, picking uh, clams up at Stanley Park. Unfortunately, with the the pollution and everything, we did start to notice a taste change. So that's why our families haven't been there since. Um, but a lot of our families remember and recall times of, of going to the beaches and, and collecting these, but also trading as well. We would trade with other First Nations, with Musqueam and even further up coast, um, things that we would have such as Hulligan, uh, which I recently found out that uh, Hulligan is more oily when they're in the lower reaches of like the Fraser River. And as they travel upwards, they, they lose their oil. And so it's a different taste. So a lot of times we would trade our Hulligans to the people up in the valley up in Stahelis and in that area and um, they really prized our Hogan's as well um, in the way that we would prepare them. Um, the connection to our land um, from all of the land base that we had, uh, we would gather such uh, food such as elk, deer, bear, goat, uh, ducks, pheasants, so many more. Um, this is not a complete list, um, but this is also a, a presentation that I created for the students just to give them an idea of some of the foods. Um, if I um, if I create more onto this presentation, I'll, I'll be more inclusive of the entire uh, food that foods that we had. But uh, for the plants that we had, we definitely um, gathered cedar, uh, wapato, berries, other foods and medicines that we would um, put to use for for the winter. Um, the heritage sites in a, in our territory. Um, there's so many and I've, I have a, a long extensive uh, background in archaeology. I've, I've been lucky enough to be in it since I was about 17 and uh, my aunt actually uh, wasn't able to make it one time. And so ever then, ever since then, I didn't kind of uh, take a step back and I was always uh, involved in archaeology. Um, 
I find that it was really awesome because I was able to go to certain areas that you would never really have to go to unless you had to work there. And so it brought me to many places out of the way um, that I'm hoping to bring our community again because um, our, our disconnect to the land is, is quite immense. We want to start traditional territories to show them these sites so they can see that and feel the connection to the land that I've felt. And uh, some of the other benefits of being in archaeology is getting to know the other First Nation representatives that were out there, such as myself, um, from the other First Nations. So Kwantlen, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, all of these people and became close friends and we would share our historical stories. And uh, from there is how we were able to find out more about ourselves and, and helping other First Nations too about the stories that we know of surrounding communities. But our um, archaeological uh, evidence that is on the land can actually be traced quite far back, if not uh, eight to 12,000 years, including up in the Coquitlam watershed, including because of the water levels at that time of the glacial receding era. Um, so it actually uh, it took me eight years to find my first arrowhead, which is the, the bottom slide here, the bottom photo. And um, I was uh, really frustrated because so many people can find their first artifact, their first arrowhead, an actual tool um, on the first couple weeks of their of their um, archaeological work. So it's, it's really frustrating that it took me that long, but I, I was able to find it and um, very, very proud, a very proud moment for me. And these are some of the archaeological sites that we see in the lake. And that's what we try to express to the um, developments that are kind of going around in our territory that no matter what destruction or what um, construction has taken place there, there's still the potential to have archaeology there. The old practices of construction uh, was a lot different from now, so now they're kind of removing material and then importing new material to, to replace that. Uh, so a long time ago, we would kind of just, they would be just moving it around. So they would remove it and then place whatever they removed back. So a lot of that archaeological material is still there. It's, it actually hasn't been taken away. And some of that, um, I have another slide uh, further on, is uh, an example of that is DHRQ 21, which is such a heavily developed area. It's been turned into a, a shipyard, at least I've heard five times they've constructed that area. And to this day, the depth of the amount of archaeology that we find goes so far down into the layers that um, you can tell that we were there for such a long time, like thousands of years. Um, this probably was a village site because you can see that a lot of tools were being made here. Uh, so a lot of times um, stations would be set up so that people could work on making these tools. Um, oh, sorry, this is the, the location that I was just speaking of. So this place has been uh, developed into a shipyard um, multiple times over the um, last few hundred years or a couple hundred years. and. Um, the amount of archaeology can be seen all across the borders. We've yet to find a true border for this archaeological site. And this also is where one of our transformer stones sit. Um, it sits just in the intersection of um, a, a little place that they want to develop into a parking lot. So the pressure is on for the nation to remove that stone. And what we've heard when we did the um, uh, burning for that, Casey did a burning, um, unfortunately, they did it without without Coquitlam's uh, participation, um, but that's okay. We can still do our own. Um, but what they found out is the messages they got from that is that the stone does not want to be removed, uh, replaced again. So once we find its final resting place, it, it can never be moved. So the the pressure is on to make sure that we know what we're doing before we place it again, and we're hoping to do that at IR one. Um, some other locations that we have in the lo the the areas are like uh, Mary Hill in our in our families and in our um, history. Uh, we've always known that there was a chief's burial ground up there. Um, and actually there was an archaeological dig when DHRQ 21 was first discovered. I believe it was in the 80s. Uh, local schools were also brought in to do uh, to help with the archaeological dig, but they were finding labrets. Uh, labrets are like um, lip plates or, or little plugs that you would put in your lower lip. And uh, there would be different sizings as you grew, you would get different ones. Uh, there are different people like other um, cultures who say that we would pass them down uh, from you know daughter mother to daughter son uh, father to son um, but what we heard in our families is that we were buried with them and so to know that we found such an extensive amount of labrets in this area they were actually displayed in the city of Port Coquitlam City Hall and we had to let them know that because we know that we were buried with these that we prefer them not to be displayed um, so they were they respectfully removed them and I think they have them at the Poco Heritage Society now um, but our, our goal is hopefully to bring our archaeological evidence home. Uh, we just need to make sure that we have a secure location for that. 
Um, another uh, significant location is just above IR number two here. Um, in, in the squared uh, red area, the rectangle there is um, a place where we know that we had six dance halls. And so that was to kind of that kind of really speaks to how much people we had to have that many. And there were there extensively like uh, large longhouses. And I think they, um, the interesting story to that is that they had, they said a horseshoe shaped um, pile of shell midden around each of those smoke houses. And it was um, just us tossing out our shell out of the windows <laughs> and um, like we didn't need it anymore. And so that it became so big around us. It was just a huge um, berm around the smokehouse. And that would that would show how much um, seafood that we were actually consuming for our ceremonies as well. Um, we would use a lot of the traditional foods and rich foods uh, to, to celebrate. Um, so up here, unfortunately, I don't know. OK, here we go. So this is the woman's camp. Um, this is something that we recently heard from a Stahelis elder. Uh, he said that we would have had a woman's camp in the Maple Creek area. And I know this is not the proper um, location of Maple Creek, um, but I think it does exit in, in this in this um, area. Uh, but Maple Creek would have been a place that we had our women's camp to prepare um, for the dancing and the, the ceremonies at the smokehouses. And then the men's camp would have been at, um, I'm sorry, I, I think I, misplaced this uh, at Lions Park, but it actually would have been at Gates Park. Um, so just near um, uh, Riverside here. And so it was, it was fairly close and um, the men were a bit closer than the women, uh, but there probably was a reason for that. Um, the women would have probably needed more privacy and to take care of their, their young ones. Um, so this is really interesting to know. And um, I know there's still a lot of archeological uh, work to be done in this area so that we can find out more about that. Um, so again, with the transformer zone, if I can just touch a little bit more on that, is um, the story that I recall um, that I'm trying to share with my community now is because we have a different story that is being said um, by Katie for the transformer stone that we're working with right now. And I couldn't find the per proper spelling for it, so I don't have the name, but I believe the transformer stone that we're working with right now is called Huitas. And that is uh, the name of the spirit that went into that. And there's always a reason why the spirits were put into these stones. But the story that I remember and I think it's important to to bring about again and to make sure everyone knows is that our uh, we recall a, a time that Hulse came to Quiquitlam specifically and told us that we were using our magic and our powers against each other and that our anger uh, was just um, bounding off of each other and we were hurting each other. And so Hulse uh, told us that we had to stop that and turn one of our members into stone to remember that we had to get along and, and, and to work in a good way. Um, but with all of the effects of residential schools and the colonialism and how life has, life has significantly changed for us, um, there's still a lot of healing that has to be done in our community and some are farther than others. And uh, it's our responsibility to make sure that they they have that support and, and that those means to heal themselves um, because we are getting close to it, um, but there's still a lot of um, struggles that we face in, in our own communities. But with the Transformer Stone, we hope that as a, as a learning tool uh, to, to help our community come around to realizing that you know, it is possible for us to, to work together again. Uh, some of the other conflicts that we've had with um, surrounding uh, like other First Nations is Haida, which was an awesome story that was shared by another Stahelis elder. Uh, he said that um, he recalls stories of Quiquitlam warring with Haida and them constantly coming to raid our supplies, raid for our people, and uh, we just got tired of it. <laughs> and so then we, we fought them here. And I think, um, I'm not too sure um, if any archeology span has been found here, but there has been places where tools have been found, which is probably where the, the conflict took place. Um, another conflict that I was recently told, which was really awesome, was um, with Cowichan. And uh, they came to war with Quiquitlam specifically. And uh, we found out about it and we sent two warriors to the upper Quiquitlam watershed, which isn't shown in this image here, um, but up into the uh, reaches where Indian Arm meets the Quiquitlam watershed. It actually has a land connection up uh, at the top of Indian Arm that connects to Harrison. That's how far it goes. And it was almost like our shortcut. We did have a a trail system back there that can still still be seen by the air today. If you go by a helicopter, we, we can still see it. Um, but here it was neat because the two warriors that were sent up to to the top to meet Cowichan, um, Cowichan met them and they were in the water 
they were waiting with their uh, goatskin leggings and they they had their hands in there and they were saying, please don't war with us. And so I, I feel it's out of a mixture of respect and fear, seeing that these these strong warriors were there as a warning to say, please don't war with us. Uh, what I find interesting about that story is that Cowichan seen that and they went home. <laughs> so to come so far to to have that that uh, conflict with us, um, to see those warriors, I, I think was a, was a really um, awesome story that I've heard and I, I really liked hearing that one. Um, the impacts of colonization, um, these these following uh, photos are, are a bit hard for me because I, I have been in archaeology and I've seen the destruction of, uh, of this is the Coquitlam Dam um, construction in the early 1900s. So when they built this dam, um, there's actually a story from that elder that we work with in Stahelis. His name was Albert Phillips and, and we speak about him highly and, and quite a lot uh, because he really helped our nation uh, about 22 years ago. Um, but he told us that there was a DFO map uh, map from uh, Department of Fisheries that they knew back in that time that they would be destroying. They, they had it marked in red where the sockeye would be removed from. And DFO was overseeing this to see where it would be possible, like it would be OK for them to do it. And obviously, like I said, we did protest this with a letter from Chief Johnny, which I had hoped that um, I could uh, include here, but uh, maybe I can share that at another time. But it was uh, Chief Johnny's letter. He lived in the Coquitlam Lake uh, in the watershed, and he protested it on behalf of Coquitlam, saying that this was our food source. You're basically taking our food from our cupboard. And what's hard for me to see is how our people would always say that we were loyal subjects to the Queen and that we would always work with our surrounding uh, the people who were moving in um, to make sure that, you know, um, it was still possible for us to get that get that salmon. Unfortunately, it fell on deaf ears and then the, the salmon was eradicated. They did try with two uh, attempts for a fish ladder, but they found that the pools were too warm and they that as the salmon sat in there, they were just dying. So after they found that the second attempt didn't work, they, they decided then not to try any further. Um, but this was the dam, uh, the first dam that was created in the early 1900s. This is the Coquitlam Dam seismic upgrade that was completed in 2008. So I did a lot of work for the archaeology for this one and a lot of the environmental work. But um, what is um, what was beneficial about doing the seismic upgrade for the dam is something that Coquitlam, uh, and again, that came from the elder uh, Albert Phillips. He said that, how about you go to them and ask them if their dam is seismic, uh, is if it's earthquake proof? Because if they have to build a new dam, that would open, that would reopen the water use planning. And in that, we would be, that would be the avenue that we could um, bring about our grievances about uh, returning our sockeye, which our families have always known about. When we brought that to um, BC Hydro to say that we wanted to return the sockeye, that was one of our grievances. They said that there was no sockeye and we didn't believe them. So we had studies done um, by uh, some consulting companies and um, I was able to be there. I was really lucky to uh, uh, participate, um, but we actually were able to find the original kokanee, which was the sockeye that adapted to be kokanee in the Coquitlam Lake. So we still have the original species. Um, it's still there and from there um, uh, in 2008, I believe it was actually that we got a, from four years before that. So in 2004, some smolts were released from the dam of the kokanee to see if they would return and if they still have that same instinct to, to return. And actually we're finding that they're coming to Bunsen too because our water signature is going into Bunsen as well uh, through the power um, generation there. Um, but with the, um, with the sockeye, um, we're hoping to use um, whatever kokanee is there as it, we might have to go to other sources so other different species of sockeye that are similar that are up in the Fraser River system. Um, but right now we're still trying with the kokanee to see if it's possible and we have just secured um, with BC Hydro uh, some funding for a fish hatchery to be, be just below the dam because we find that the smolt out migration to get through the out low level outlets of the dam is creating such a high death rate that there's not much that is returning. So if we can get that hatchery down below the dam, they can be reared there and safely released and then we'll get a larger return. Uh, the, the fish populations in this is, is quite high. There, there's uh, cutthroat trout. When I was doing the studies, I was, I was um, pretty amazed to see these different fish that I've never seen, but uh, cutthroat trout, long nose sucker, and northern pike minnow are the larger fish as well as the kokanee that are up in the Coquitlam Lake, as well as the smaller fish, which are like red side shiners, uh, Pima chubs. Um, but um, 
it's, it's awesome to see that there is a fish population up there. And with Metro Vancouver, they are very worried and rightfully so. They're worried about the water and the drinking water. And that's something that we share. We share that concern because our, our community uses that same water. Um, at no point would we ever want to, to harm anyone's um, health in that way. Um, but they're worried about taste and odor for, for the water. Um, when we went to uh, Washington in the early 2000s, um, we went with BC Hydro to uh, Cedar River down in Washington, and they had a similar system where they had returned sockeye and they had an ozonation plant. And they said, as long as you have an ozonation plant, you won't have to worry about taste and odor. It will take care of that for you. We have four, uh, three treatments. We have um, ozonation, chlorination, and UV treatments to our water. And they want to look at a, a, a fourth treatment uh, fairly soon here, um, but it's, um, it's interesting to know that we do have some of the cleanest water and, and the amount of um, municipalities that it uh, um, provides for is, is quite amazing um, of all most of Metro Vancouver uh, for such a small watershed. I do know that um, I think they are looking to increase the levels of the lake, um, but again, they would have to work with Quiquilm to ensure that um, the archeology span and the heritage is taken care of. Um, uh, this is uh, one of the photos that I have a hard time with because, sorry, I just, um, um, uh, down below here, you would see on the, the beaches here, this is where we would have been in as recently as when the dam was built. Uh, so when you see they, they knew how far they would be raising the water levels and they logged that area, um, this is where we're finding the archaeology now. And that would have been at a different era, a different time that we would have been in those reaches um, when those water levels were receding. So we're seeing um, archaeology that is very ancient and um, the new technology that we would have had uh, for our tools, including slate, ground slate technology, um, we started using that more, more uh, commonly, but also firecrack rock. A lot of that uh, would indicate that a site was in the area. So firecrack rock is round uh, granite stones that we would have used to heat in um, tightly woven cedar baskets that were actually watertight. Um, we would add these hot stones that would be in the fire and put them in the baskets and they would actually boil the water. Um, so after repetitive use of those stones, uh, we would use them over and over again. They would uh, get heat wear and um, firecrack rock would be created and you would have the markings of the charcoal and the reddening. And we don't see that in the watershed. So again, we're, oh, sorry. Uh, we're just looking at um, the upper reaches and, and uh, the archaeology that we're finding. But which is, what is interesting is that we can go to many of these beaches and in, the, in one season, uh, for one of our trips, we could find like 200, if not 300 artifacts in one section of beach. When we return to that same beach, probably if not six months later, um, we're finding the same amount of artifacts. What we're having a hard time is finding the, where are they eroding from? Where are they coming from? Are they coming from the actual levels that we're finding it? Um, we actually had, um, I'm sorry, I'm talking about this so much, but um, on the west side, we had two stations set up by Brown and Oaks Archaeology where they had fake artifacts set up. Um, and they uh, painted them with um, marine enamel uh, pink so that we could actually visually see it on the beach. And they fixed them with uh, radio frequency identification tags. And from there, we were able to use a small device to see if we can find them. Of the, um, I think they placed about 200 and we found less than 50. We could only recover less than 50 of those. And they were just obsidian flakes that were done uh, from the art napping up at SFU. And so those were the, the fake artifacts that we were using and uh, we could bar barely find any of them. But what we found <clears throat> is that they were moving up uh, up the beach, they were moving down the beach, we were, they were getting lost in the lake and they were also venturing uh, left and right. Uh, so it was a lot of uh, wave action um, is also creating a lot of destruction on the beaches when the logs are being rolled onto the beach as well. Um, there's a lot of debris that comes down from the creeks in the lake and Metro Vancouver um, every year they, they manage that. Um, but uh, to know that the destruction and the the raising of the water levels and the decrease of it um, is also having an impact on that. So BC Hydro is working with um, Quiquitlam and we're hoping to revamp it and, and try and make it a little bit more extensive because what we're doing right now doesn't seem to be enough. And uh, hopefully, and we found quite a lot of sites. I can't recall the exact number, um, but there's definitely about 100 sites up in Quiquitlam Lake. Um, one of my favorite sites, um, which I don't have a picture of right now, is the peninsula. Um, there's a peninsula that's at the top of the lake and uh, it would have been a place that we'd sun dried salmon. That was what Albert Phillips uh, from Stahelis had told us, that we didn't wind dried our salmon, we we would uh, sun dry it on, on those flat stones of that peninsula. 
And so it was really awesome to hear again a story coming from a different community helping us regain regain our history and culture. Um, this is a story. Um, oh, this is a picture of Coquitlam uh, Island in Coquitlam Lake. Um, and then just to the right here would have been Cedar River. Or sorry, sorry, Cedar Creek. Uh, Cedar Creek is where there is um, isotope testing that has been done there, and they found the the signatures of our historic sockeye run up in that area. Um, so it's it's really interesting, and we're hoping that's. Um, I think we're. They also did a coho release uh, as early. I think it was last year. Um, so they're hoping to also restore coho to the Coquitlam Lake. Um, but again, I think our, our goal would be to focus on the sockeye. And, and we're working with all the entities that are around us, DFO, um, uh, different uh, uh, stewardship groups that are helping us restore the sockeye. Um, but again, a very big passion of ours uh, is to restore this run. Uh, this is um, Glen Joe. And so this was uh, the um, release in 2008 where 10 sockeye returned. And it was the highest return that we've had to date. Uh, some years we don't get any, some years we only get one or two. But again, uh, we're going to focus on that small out migration. And um, these sockeye used to run in such high numbers that our people said that we could literally walk on the backs of the salmon. I don't know if we ever tried. Um, it would be interesting to see, but you could walk on the backs of the salmon to get to the other side. You could skip a stone across the backs of the salmon and it would reach the other side. It was so thick in the Coquitlam River that you could not travel when the salmon were running. It was just so thick you could not travel by water up the river. Um, so it's just amazing stories that we hear. And they were actually a smaller, they, um, people have said that they were the bastard sockeye. And I'm not too sure, like there must be a term for that, like saying that they were a smaller species, but they are definitely closely related to the Pit Lake sockeye that Coquitlam also has a high uh, connection to with the KC people. But the Pit Lake sockeye are one of my prized um, foods that I love to get. Um, it has its own taste. I, I, I just love it. Um, it's got beautiful green back, very distinct from, from the Adams run or the Stewart's run. Um, but again, I'm still learning <laughs> and uh, I actually really love uh, learning how to fillet on a pit lake salmon. I, I find it's very beautiful, but um, uh, very, very awesome. I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be, get, be able to get some this year. Uh, so moving forward, um, uh, we are hoping to, uh, we have just secured the service agreement, which has been a long time coming for our nation. This is something that's been 30 years in the making for, for our families that have, have worked on this in the chief and councils and working with the mayor and council. Um, we've faced one hiccup after another, but another um, big step that happened in 2020 was we secured land code. So now we have taken that and, and made it our own. And so there are so many different acts in the Indian Act, but we have land code now. And so now when we develop IR number two, it won't take so long. There's not such a long process and so many hoops for us to jump through uh, to get something done there. Uh, with land code, we still have the obligation and then within our, our own community as well. Um, but to make those those laws and those regulations as just as well as uh, Canada and the province, uh, but to make them even better for, for our lands to protect it um, for any development that happens there. Um, so with land code, we'll be able to um, really um, set ourselves up for, for what we want to see there. And with the service agreement now, that was the only thing that was holding us back um, was to get servicing there. Um, and now that we have it, we've found that the Canadian Tax Board came to us and said that we have the best service agreement that they've ever seen in Canada. And so that was our council working with the mayor and uh, working with the council to um, to find out the best uses. So I didn't understand. I thought it was just sewer and water, and, but it's not. It's also the the police and the fire and all the services that come to, to the nation. Um, so to, to see that it's actually happened is, is a big celebration. And one thing that we like to do um, that we've recently started because we, we secured land code, we were officially effective in land code on July 1st, 2020. And I said, we have to celebrate. <laughs> and so that's kind of our anniversary. And we've reclaimed that day um, uh, from Canada Day to celebrate Coquitlam. And uh, I think it's it's a really important healing tool for our, our community to really celebrate all of the accomplishments that we have every year. And one of the things that we like to do um, that we've incorporated last year was uh, including the end of school ceremony. So really showcasing the students and uh, really helping them understand um, the progress that we're making in our own nation and then showing them that uh, we're there to support them in their in their education. Um, so our our uh, goal is to bring our, our students out and, and help with any of the local schools. But here we have a picture. Um, that it's really touches my heart is uh, the cedar stripping that we did in 2019. It was the first one that we did in the Coquitlam watershed and uh, it was a big event for us. Uh, we had two two uh, events that we were able to do up there and uh, here we have Kalia Lopez on the left. Uh, she attended Como Lake Middle School and uh, Bree Hall 
and I, I can't recall. I know she was at Montgomery, um, but these are our, they were best friends, and uh, I was I was lucky to bring them out, and um, we have a, a lot of uh, good work that is coming forward for the cedar that we've collected. We have used some of the cedar from this uh, harvest uh, for a cedar cape that is going to be displayed at Sumikoela. And uh, it's a beautiful cedar cape. I'm hoping that we'll be able to teach those skills to our to our young ones in our community. Um, but at the same time, I don't have the weaving skills, so I'm I'm reaching out right now to see if um if we can get some uh, some help with that. But uh, definitely, our community is excited to work with the resources that we gathered last year. Uh, so we actually also gathered cedar roots, which is very hard. <laughs> with uh, cedar stripping, it's really awesome because you only do about two hand widths. Um, about last year, I heard someone say that they only do one hand width, but what I've been taught is two hand widths, and that's not spread apart, so it's just two hands held together. So you're not really taking too much from the tree, and you'd make an incision with a little hatchet on the bottom, and then from there, just making your way up the tree, you'd go back and forth and then just strip it off the tree. Um, that takes about less than 20 minutes. Uh, very easy to do the stripping. It's the removal of the outer bark that will take you at least uh, maybe two or three hours, um, depending like on the amount of resources that you get or amount of stripping. But um, it, it's very um, soothing. And I found that when I was pregnant last year, I was uh, anxious and I had the restless leg syndrome and I just could not sit down for the life of me. But when I had cedar in front of me, I could sit there for hours and it never bothered me. You get me in front of a TV and I couldn't handle it. But when I was with my cedar and I was just sitting there outside, I, I could sit there for hours and I felt nice and calm. It was, it was very healing. But um, some of the other work that we've done in the Colton Watershed is we were able to get, uh, uh, I think it's an 800, 800 year old um, log. Um, so a cedar log that had fallen naturally from some of the windstorms that happened that year. And uh, we were able to get one. Brandon Gabriel, which is behind on the, the right photo here. Um, Brandon Gabriel is the, the carver from Kwantlen. And so we did a house post. And this was a project from Port Moody. Um, and they're going to be displaying this house post in uh, Rocky Point Park. Um, but because of COVID that hit in 2020 and um, some other hiccups that they've had, um, they have had to delay the, the, uh, the unveiling of this. Um, but it is complete. Um, I think there's a photo here. Um, so this is this was a, a sleeping ceremony that we had to, to lay it to rest until it was ready to be unveiled. And so a red cloth was placed over her eyes. We believe that the cedar has a, a woman's spirit. And uh, here is the um, rendering of the story that we shared with Brandon Gabriel that we wanted to share on our house post because this is a Quiquitlam house post. Um, I think there's also a house post being erected for Tsleil-Waututh that they own, they have their own carver for, and I'm not sure if Musqueam, but there are multiple house posts that'll they'll be erected soon. Um, but this is the story of the restoring of our sockeye run, and it's it's really awesome because they show the salmon and they show the woman here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, one thing that's not kind of on the the sh um, screen here at the top is uh, I think they have four or five eagle feathers, and while we never had really any war bonnets. It was still um, important, I think, for Brandon to represent each of the families that are in our nation. And so he has those uh, five families, the main families that are, are down here. And um, again, with the woman's spirit and back here, um, it came from one of our elders. She wanted to see some of the mountains and having that natural uh, feeling to it. So they were able to carve some mountains and, and just below that near the tail, you'll see electricity. And that was to represent the man-made electricity that was being introduced into the watershed. So it's it very awesome to see how they they put together a story and the house posts are different uh, from totem poles because this is what we would have used as the structures of our house uh, of our smoke houses of our dance halls and it would be our focal point to to have our oral teachings and our history and so this is where we would share our stories um, but they would still be a part of the structure of the actual building um, we're hoping to also create uh, more um, classes for because that's kind of what COVID has kind of interrupted. We did have a few cultural classes going on. So some of the things that I've tried to start is like traditional foods and cooking is just um, getting used to some of the foods that we see on the land and developing new recipes for them so that our community can actually enjoy them because something like hooligan oil, which is something that our, one of our community members is really keen on, on trying to recreate that again. Um, we would have a hard time eating it. And we've heard from other First Nations as well who have been introduced to it. Um, that it is quite hard when you're not growing up with that taste. Um, but if we can find these foods and find new recipes for it, um, we did traditional foods and cooking kind of like a class. But I think in that year of, um, I think it was November 2020 that everything just kind of shut down. 
but uh, here on the on the right uh, is another photo of the youth and uh, we have a garden actually in this area and it's a fire pit area that um, we like to teach the the children about um, actually unfortunately the, some of the younger kids destroyed our devil's club plant <laughs> um, but here we do um, seasonal ceremonies and it came from a uh, conversation I had with one of the former councillors, uh, Fred Hulbert, and he said he wanted to start seasonal ceremonies to honour the time of the season and what it brings for us. And so the only direction he gave me was that he wanted the children to represent the spring and the elders to represent the fall. Um, from there, I have asked him to in, kind of be in, uh, participating in, in our ceremonies, which I started for him um, that year in 2020. And so we've only initiated the spring one in 2019 and then last year, 2020 and then this year. Um, but we're hoping to incorporate the other seasons as well, which I've kind of filled in the blanks to have youth represent the summertime. Um, and I, I say that as a way that they're starting to learn how to harvest these foods and be a part of the community. And the elders would be there to help them uh, understand how to uh, store those foods and, and those resources in the fall time. But in the winter, we would have the adults that would um, bring us through that long period of time and have that strength to to bring the community forward. Um, so that's what we're hoping to do in the future. But um, this is uh, how we say Heitsepka. Heitsepka means thank you all. Um, Heitschka would be thank you to one person. Uh, so Heitsepka and uh, thank you all for your time. Um, I can continue to go on forever, uh, but I do realize that we have a, a time schedule and um, I'm free for any questions that um, anyone has. I just got it. If, if anybody has any questions for Nancy, please write them in the Q&A and I'll read them to her. So while we're waiting for some uh, questions, uh, it, thank you, Nancy, for so much knowledge that you have shared with us, so much deep teachings. Still processing everything that you said. Uh, first question, can you hear me okay? I have a bit of an echo. I can hear you. Okay, is the public allowed to visit the Transformer Stone? Um, I'm not too sure. It is in a in a kind of um, out of the way area right now. I'm not sure if prickle bushes are kind of surrounding it, um, but it is something that uh, we have to create uh, a place for it. We have a place that is chosen, but we might have to um, uh, think of a new location for it, but still on IR1. Um, what we found is that we really have to work with the other First Nations um, because of the overlaps. Uh, we have Katesi, Musqueam, I think even in Semiamu, uh, uh, Tawasin and Slavletooth. Uh, we respect the other First Nations that they have that connection to the Transformer Stone as well. Um, but we were, were able to do was work with the other First Nations that it would be in Katesi and Quiquitlam's hands as being in our, our core territories. Um, so we're, we're lucky to have the grace of Katesi allowing us to bring it to IR1 and we're very happy for that. Um, we feel that it is Quiquitlam's in, in, in our own minds, um, but still respecting that Katesi has a, a strong connection to it as well. So they do want to see um, a place for it so that their own elders can come see it as well as the uh, our own elders. So we're trying to create it so that it's access accessible and it's not too far out of the way and that it's in a safe spot. Um, what we've been told again from the burning, we do get a lot of messages from the burning and it's, it's amazing to hear. I can I can share those as well. But uh, the message that we got for the burning for this uh, transformer stone is that it cannot have any a platform, it has to be natural ground. It cannot have any enclosement, so it can't have any fencing and it can't have any cover. So it has to be just on natural ground, open as it always has been. And uh, from there, we'll still create informational kiosks. So I think Katesy is gonna share one and then we're gonna share one uh, of what we what we feel. I think um, Katesy prefers to have their own and uh, just respecting everyone's uh, feelings for that. But I will ask if um, the public is allowed to view it, we might have to set up some uh, protocols, maybe some um, actual times where it's allowed. Um, just thinking off the top of my head, but I will ask to see if public is allowed and it will be again accessible because we want the elders to see it as well. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we have a couple questions about what is a transformer stone? Um, so um, with Hulls and uh, our creation stories, uh, Hulls had the power to to change our people into stone and to, I think, different items as well. Um, I'd have to check into that. But for Transformer Stones, it was our lessons and our history. Um, it was um, what Hulls had seen on the land and how we were behaving. Um, so 
if people were overfishing. I know there I, I do recall a story of that of people overfishing and realizing that they had to to realize only that they had to take as much as they needed. Um, so even back then, um, which is interesting is that I, I recall stories from our elders in Quicotlam that we had almost like fishery officers, like we would protect protect the, the waters, we would make sure that we knew which streams we could go to. And in other communities, I've seen that as well. And you also see it in documentaries as well, where local First Nations um, have stories of them uh, placing eggs and they would use cedar uh, cedar boxes and they would bring those eggs to different stream systems so that they could reestablish a new run. Um, so again, they knew how to take care of the land and uh, it, was, it was just really interesting to see that um, with those creation stories, it really helped us uh, develop who we are and what our culture became and uh, really teaching us to, to work as one and work with the land and, and respect it as well. Thank you, Nancy. Another question is, what is a wapato? Oh, uh, yes, uh, wapato. Uh, some of the um, traditional foods I'm really excited for now that the, the growing season is here, but wapato would be like an Indian potato. <laughs> I know I shouldn't say Indian, um, but that is something that um, our, our people say is um, it's an indigenous plant. In Katesi, they had an archaeological site that they uncovered in kind of the, the fields there where they found stone walkways where we they would have been walking through the water water bogs areas which is where Wapata grow and they didn't want to walk through that muck <laughs> and so they created stone pathways in the water so that all they had to do was just kick it up with their toe the, the tubers they are tubers so they would float to the surface and then they would collect all the, all the Wapato. Um, my husband has been able to try it. He says it's a bit of a sweet taste. So when you roast it, I've heard that it's a, a sweeter taste, almost like a sweet potato. Um, and I think it's a different taste when you boil it or, or prepare it in a different way. Um, but there are so many other plants that I'm hoping to, to um, um, oh, sorry, it's my, my, my son, uh, become more familiar with. So like fiddleheads, uh, even spruce tips. One thing I, I brought to uh, my uh, elder recently, a few days ago, was that I wanted to try cambium, which I'd heard what our people had tried. He says, that's a starvation food. <laughs> he says, that's when you just needed to get nutrients into you. But the stories that I heard is that we would climb the trees, the men would climb the trees and um, remove the, the softer bark at the top. And uh, that would be thrown down to the women who would have cedar mats to collect it. And uh, that's where we would make a soup out of it, I guess. <laughs> and just to get that nutrients into us. I thought we would have probably eat, eaten the cambium. But uh, the spruce tips I'm very interested in because um, I heard you can just like literally eat it off the tree and you can add it to salads. Um, also fiddleheads I heard taste like Brussels sprouts when you when you roast them, I believe. Um, but what I heard last year is someone said, I don't know if I would try them again because you don't know what's wound up in them. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but maybe if we just clean them up and make sure that they're, they're good. But I did hear that with fiddleheads, you have to prepare them in a certain way and be very careful that it's it's done clean, uh, cleansely, like make sure that it's clean and uh, make sure that you're doing it in a proper way so that you're not um, getting sick from it. <laughs> so, but it's, it's very interesting that uh, hopefully our, our community and then we can share that with the school district as well. Thank you. Um, there's a few questions and individuals are asking if they're allowed to display some of the slides that you have shared today. Oh, absolutely. I, I've. Um, provided this, I think, to David Sear and Rob Cowie. So definitely, if anyone wants to, to use the presentation, um, it's very generic. It was meant for the students, so that's kind of why um, it's there. We did add a little additions for, for the teachers here today. Um, but yeah, feel free to use everything that I've, I've displayed, and um, it's, it's a, a great resource to, to use to teach with the students. Um, thank you, Nancy. And the next question is, what was the purpose of a lip plate? I think that was, oh, okay, that was for status, and so um, it's awesome that I, I always forget these little pieces, but um, uh, so with status, that would have been the Skoyhoi status that we had. So in the dancing, uh, the Skoyhoi dance uh, society that we had, um, you had different statuses. And so a lot of the times we would have to raid other First Nations for supplies or resources or even men, uh, women and children, which we would incorporate into our community. And they were um, in the, uh, I guess, I don't know what to say, like the the colonial or the European way of saying it is that it was slaves, um, but it's not slaves. They were incorporated into our community. They just had less status, that's all. Um, they were still taken care of. They were still loved. 
and they were made to be a part of our community, just not with the status of the families who held the, the masks. And so being uh, part of the Skoihoi uh, Dance Society, you would have, uh, you would be a part of the masks, uh, the Skoihoi mask and the dancing. And that's quite extensive and it's very sensitive. It's very sensitive to talk about and something that we don't talk about too often, um, just because uh, we're very protective of it. Um, because of the way that it was taken from us, uh, we found stories, um, which was awesome that we shared in uh, interviews that I, I had done in uh, Stahelis, uh, Kelsey Charlie and Willie Charlie, recall that Quiquitlam William, who, who was kind of the, the leader of our time when, when the cities were named Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam, Quiquitlam William would go to Stahelis when our culture was going underground. And so he would go there to, to help teach them how to do that so that way that they could still practice it. And what they said was really awesome is that because we've lost so much over that time, that now Stahelis is teaching us. And so they're, they have those teachings and they can teach us those teachings that Quiquitlam William taught them. Uh, Quiquitlam William was such a strong man uh, he lived to be, I think, 114. Um, but he did the traditional way of, of death. So he did the four days of fasting before his death. He knew he was going to die. I believe he he died and passed away in Royal Columbian Hospital. Um, but he was a very traditional man. He held so many songs. He held, I think, hundreds of songs, which is quite high. Um, usually you have like maybe three or four songs to your, to your name. But uh, to have that many songs and the way he would dance around the smokehouse, he just danced effortlessly with so much energy and for hours on end that the drummers would get tired and they would have to rest and, and trade out because he was such a strong dancer. Um, so he has taught so many people. He's taught um, people in uh, Musqueam. So Vince Stogan, uh, he had, has passed on, but his daughter and his son, Thelma Stogan and Smitty Stogan, have recently worked with us as, as early as yesterday. Um, but to have those connections, we find that Quiquot Mullen has helped so many people, and now those people are helping us. And so it is just a, a two-way street. Um, so we're very happy for that. Well, thank you, Nancy. Still so much knowledge you were sharing. <laughs> there is about um, 22 more questions, which um, okay. I will print off and share with you, but maybe um, one more question. Sure. Sure. So um, somebody would like to know if there's information on the seasonal ceremonies. Um, OK, so that's uh, something that, again, it was just a conversation I'd had with um, Councillor Fred Halbert at the time, and it was a three hour conversation that I had with him and we just sat in the boardroom and um, and he just talked about so much. He one of the stories that he shared was that when he went up to the Quilton watershed, there was so like he just opened the car door and the smell of blueberries just filled the air. And there was just so many blueberries that he said everyone in our community could go and try and pick them and you would not get every one. There's just that many going all the way up the valley that he had seen. I, I wish I knew the place that he had meant. But from that is where he said he wanted to start seasonal ceremonies. And I want to know, I'd, I'd have to find that out. So that is a, a good task for me, is to find out if this is something traditionally that we did or if it's something that he wants to see done because it is still honoring the time and it would be a good learning opportunity for our community to find out what each season brings us and how we can come together. So it's, it's also a, another way of gathering. And uh, with the with the youth, uh, sorry, with the children, so far what we do is uh, we um, have four students. We select four students or four volunteers who want to come forward with four plants that we choose. So the first one, I tried to find cedar, uh, cedar saplings, um, but I could only find Douglas fir that year for 2019. Um, so they had little Douglas fir saplings. So four was presented to our garden for the community. And then each one of the students gets to go home, each one of the children, sorry, get to go home with a, a plant for the family. Um, so I think for 2020, oh no, sorry, 2020 we missed, but 2021 last year we did uh, licorice root plants and uh, strawberry plants as well. Uh, but this year we were able to find the cedar saplings. I was really happy. And so everyone goes home with a, a little sapling and they get to present one to, to our um, garden. For the other ones, we want to find out um, what offering can be made for the youth, the elders and the adults. Um, but again, I just want to leave that um, because the children don't have any real representation in our community. We have a youth group coordinator, we have adult group coordinator and an elder group coordinator. We kind of want to leave that in their hands to see what they want to develop it as. But with the children's, we find that the staff really take care of them. And so we, we help them get them out there, give them the confidence and have the youth help them as well, um, just to teach them that it's it's OK to do the ceremony work. And it's also a, an education for the ceremony work that we do when we call witnesses, uh, what the witnesses are for. Witnesses are meant to relay our oral history and our, our teachings. And so 
uh, when you're called as a witness, you have the responsibility, but also the honor to share what happened that day. And so if someone asks, well, what happened, you know, at that spring ceremony in 2021, um, then you can say, well, this happened. These people came. This is what we learned. This is the good feelings that we had. And so witnessing is uh, done for naming ceremonies, so many different things, um, but there's still a lot to be learned and shared uh, through the oral histories there. And again, that's again going to the house posts that we would have in the, the buildings that we would have. And um, some of the other information that I had uh, just on the side note was um, that we had plank homes that would be almost like we would have the planks and we would remove those planks and take them to a different plank house. So we would use, reuse those planks um, if we wanted to move down to the lower reaches of the rivers here. Um, that's where we would uh, set up for the summertime, but then we would just take those planks and go up to the watershed and, and reapply them. But um, it was just very interesting to know that our house posts were definitely oral stories and how we can share our ceremony work that we do, especially with the seasonal ceremonies. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I see that we're at, at the end of our time with you, so I will um, save these questions and send them to you for oh, some answers. You. But thank you so much for sharing so much knowledge and connecting us back to place and the land and here where we work and how we can move forward with the youth in our own understanding and connecting us today of all days on Earth Day. So. Marcy Tonse, thank you for sharing with us today and I look forward to our next conversation. And I know you wanted to say something about the song that's going to play as we head out today. So again, yes. Tonse, thank you. Hi, Tepka all. Uh, this is a song that was written by the KC First Nation youth, which I'm in uh, the class, uh, my SFU language class with Lily Cunningham. So she spearheaded this initiative and she, her question was, why can't we have new songs? Like, why are we always using the old songs? And I think in our culture and our history, like in our, in our mindset right now, we want to know what the authentic culture is. And so we don't really explore new things yet. Um, so she asked this question. And what was awesome is that this song came to the KC youth so fast that it was meant to be. It was like the spirits were speaking through them. Um, in another class that I have, uh, Victor Guerin in our afternoon classes through SFU language, um, he says that he did uh, some song quests. He actually had to do a song quest uh, for the Olympics when they came in 2010. Um, so he um, definitely had to go to the mountains. He, he had so much time and a lot of the times a song will come to you in little snippets. And I've actually had a song come to me uh, last year and I actually heard it in a rattle sound. And so it was just kind of in your mind. And as you're resting, I think when you're sleeping and you're just drifting off to sleep, you can kind of hear it. Sometimes you'll also dream about it, but with when you're really trying to create a song, you'll have to do that quest uh, work and actually going out and just, you know, getting one with yourself and, and getting one with nature, um, but just feeling that and getting that song come to you. So to know that this song came so naturally to them is really awesome. And I, I just wanted to share that with you today. But hi, Tepka all, and I, I look forward to meeting every one of you and, um, and working with uh, the school district in a good way.